Please open your Bibles to Psalm 119. We're going to look at one verse. Verse 139. David says, My zeal has consumed me. Then he adds these words, because my adversaries have forgotten thy words. This verse sets before us two different people. One is the author of the psalm, David. The other is plural in number. Adversaries are enemies. David further describes his enemies characterized by a forgetting of the Word of God. In other words, they were not at this point David's enemies because they were giving him a rough time. But interestingly enough, as David describes it, they've forgotten God's word. Forgotten? Well, I believe we could understand from that that God's word no longer had any authority over them. They were ignoring it. They were flagrantly disobeying it. And that grieved David. We should note that David draws out a very vital contrast of what we might call character or lack of character with two words, zeal, forgotten. In many ways, zeal is opposite to forgetfulness and forgetfulness is opposite to zeal. It's not been that long ago since we spent a good bit of time giving emphasis to the matter of the zealous Christian, talking about zeal in various areas of our Christian life. Prayer, Bible reading, worship. We defined zeal as great energy or enthusiasm in the pursuit of a cause or an objective. What about David's zeal? How would it be on the scale? It was no small zeal with David. It was a consuming zeal. My zeal has consumed me. Psalm 69, David expresses it in these words. Consumed me, or the King James, my zeal has eaten me up. It's devoured me. What is this cause of such strong descriptive language as consume, consumed me, eaten me up? This is no ordinary zeal. Or some perhaps favorite sport. Or one's job or career or hobby. But 
I believe if we probe this matter deeper, we will see that what a man really loves, he would have others respect. He would not tolerate having it dishonored. <coughs> Christ told his followers about love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. Notice the little word all. A L L. <coughs> That kind of love, that all love, would also include a love for God's Word. Can't separate the two. And that kind of love will be greatly grieved when God's name is taken in vain. when God and his cause are neglected. Perhaps we could illustrate it on a human level. With what zeal would you protect your child from impending danger? It's your flesh and blood. You love that child. You would risk your life. Why would you risk your life? Well, because you love your child. Well, then, how much do we love God and His Word? With all your heart, He said. So how much would we risk? to protect it, to protect the honor of God and His Word. David had a consuming love for God and for God's Word. David in other Psalms describes the godly man who delights in the Word of God. Psalm 1 how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Actually, throughout Psalm 119, again and again, David says, Oh, how I love thy law. But I love thy law. So David was grieved at those who had forgotten it. Not because it had dropped off of their radar screen, but because it no longer had authority. It's as if David is saying, I cannot be coldly affected where thy glory, Lord, is concerned. Since I have had a taste of thy grace, felt the benefit of thy word, I cannot endure it should be contemned. And it much moves me to see creatures so mad upon their own destruction and to make light of your salvation. Such was the love that David had for God, for God's word. It grieved him exceedingly to see any of God's workmanship perishing. grieved him to see men ignoring the word of God and 
being captivated to the world and made factors for the devil and fuel for hellfire, being violent as to their own destruction. Because that's what happens when you ignore God's word. How would we concisely state the doctrine that we're dealing with? Here it is. That great and pure zeal becomes those that have any affection for the word of God and for the ways of God. That's stating it doctrinally. And in that doctrinal statement, I've used two words to define the zeal that we're talking about. Two little words, great and pure. Those are significant terms for our purposes. Great zeal and pure zeal. By using the term great, we're using it because how David described his zeal. It was a zeal that consumed him. I would call that great. We're using the term pure because David's zeal was not based on what we would call personal injury or insult, but rather it had to do with a right and proper respect for God's zeal. David's zeal and love for God's word is expressed in our text and in the verse that follows. So go back to Psalm 119, 139. My zeal has consumed me because my adversaries have forgotten thy words. Then he describes the word, here's the purity of it. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loves it. There's a couple of questions that we could ask and seek to answer. What is the nature of true zeal? Second question, why should such zeal be the result of one's love for the Word of God? So question number one, what is the nature of true zeal? Well, first of all, let me tell you that there's two kinds of zeal, carnal and spiritual. Carnal zeal based on wrong motives or, or motives less than something that comes close to being the value of God's word. Carnal zeal is based many, many times on wrong causes, which ultimately ends in wrong consequences. James identifies one of those wrong Causes. Turn with me to James 3 and verse 14. <clears throat> if 
James 3, 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This bitter jealousy or selfish ambition could be captured in the words bitter zeal. Resulting, of course, in wrong consequences. Skip on down to verse 16. It becomes even more clear. For where jealousy and, here it is, selfish ambition. Well, you could write across the top of that, wrong zeal. And what does James say is the result? There is this order in every evil thing. Wrong cause, wrong consequences. Well, that certainly is not the zeal found in our text this morning. Quite different. There's another kind of sort of carnal zeal which also has a wrong cause. Though it may outwardly at times seem to have a good cause, and that is the cause of false religion. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation, for I bear them witness, notice carefully these words, that they have a zeal for God, but in accordance, but not in accordance with knowledge. There's the zeal, misguided zeal, wrong zeal. Actually, Paul was a part of that at one time. He was a very zealous man. He persecuted the church beyond measure, advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. And he even says it in Galatians, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Many times I believe people who are following false religions manifest a zeal that exceeds our zeal for God and for His work. Zeal must have a right object or it will not be great. But it cannot be good and pure and holy without a right object. There's spiritual and holy zeal And it can be best described by these matters. Its cause, its object, <clears throat> its effects, its use. And we're going to look at some of those. As I was just bringing that thought to you, I couldn't help but think of some of the missionaries, particularly Pastor Bala. Has anyone here had the opportunity of knowing Pastor Bala? I believe, yeah, you two guys did. He's about this tall. 
small guy. But I've never met anybody that radiated as much joy and enthusiasm and tireless, tireless effort. Amen. He is a man of God. And you can't observe him very long until it is so obvious in his character, his conversation, his mannerisms, and his ministry. Whether it's in New Zealand or, or Sri Lanka, he's there working all the time. Well, let's think a moment about the cause. The true cause of spiritual and what we might say holy zeal is love to God and the things that belong to God. Now, all people basically are consumed with one kind of zeal or another. Psalms 127, we read these words, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. Sometimes all of that can be captured in one word. The word greed. Just plain greedy. For more, for better, for whatever. And it eats them up. We worked out in West Dallas back when I was in high school. My parents were involved in a children's club out there and I helped them. We met many of the families. Manuela was one of the little girls that came to our Bible club back in the 60s. And we discovered somehow that some of the people who have purchased their little three, four room house had been cheated. And the way they were cheated was that the papers that were drawn up when they purchased the house was that the payments would all go to interest, nothing on the principal. And here the dear people are working hard, paying month by month, making their payments, and two, three, four years go by and they want to sell their house and move out and do better and they were told you don't own anything. Not one dime do you own. I remember going to talk to the owner of those houses about that situation and he was a lawyer. And he just laughed it off. Like, no, oh, too bad. And then he looked at me and he said, Do you know how much it takes money to take to satisfy me? I said, No, sir. He said, Just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. A man eaten up by greed. Zealous and cheating and lying to people. Ephesians describes them, and they having become callous have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. 
They've given themselves to it. And I want to say to your people, we ought to be possessed by a supreme love for God and a love that would manifest zeal in promoting God's glory at all costs. Secondly, the object. What is the object of this holy zeal? God has three objectives in this world. His truth, his worship, and his servants. All three must be tenderly looked after and carefully guarded. And when they are wronged and maligned, it should cause great grief. Let's look closer at those objectives. Truth. Zeal seeks to preserve the truth of God inviolable. And that's why, because we, dear people, are the trustees of God's truth for the future generation. And that's why we must be very, very careful. And that's why, as a church, we must have a confession of faith to which we subscribe. It's in writing. You have to subscribe to it to be a member of the church, to be an officer. It's a standard by which we govern our church and doctrine. book of Jude, we read these words, contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Buy the truth and sell it not. There are many who have gone before us who have paid the price, the ultimate price. God's worship. That's another objective of God. We should guard carefully. We've spent time on worship. I found this brief summary that kind of puts it all together. Peter Masters wrote a book called Worship in the Melting Pot. Listen carefully. Our approach to worship is undoubtedly the most important issue confronting Bible churches today. And here's why. Six new, highly flawed styles of worship may be observed, and sometimes all mixed together. There is personal pleasure worship, which puts the worshiper's enjoyment in first place rather than God's desire. Then there's worldly idiom worship, which borrows the current entertainment music of the world with its rhythms, instruments, actions, and show business presentation, heedless of all the Bible's warnings about loving the world. There is aesthetic worship, which imagines that orchestras, bands, and instrumental solos are real expressions of worship, as if God is worshiped through these things, whereas Christ said, God is a spirit, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then there's ecstatic worship in which people work themselves into highly emotional and even semi-hypnotic states. Whereas scripture says we must always pray and sing with the understanding. And then there's shallow worship which reduces hymns to choruses 
conveying one or two elementary ideas because solid spiritual themes are not wanted. There is informal worship in which casual, jokey, trivia, injecting leaders turn churches into sitting rooms, so depriving the Lord of dignity, reverence, grandeur, and glory. And interestingly enough, listen to this statement. It's as though evangelical churches have caught six viruses. I thought that was interesting. Caught six viruses at the same time. How can churches survive if their highest occupation is sick? How can God's people keep themselves unspotted from the world if the world has taken over the worship? How can we call lost souls out of the world if we're the same as the world? God's word. God's worship. God's servants. God's servants are God's gift to the church. The Bible says that God gives gifts to men and God gives those men as gifts to the church. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, says, We request you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work, live at peace with one another. In the past, God's servants have been severely persecuted. Not the least of which was the Apostle Paul. Imprisonments, beaten times without number, danger of death five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, beaten with rods, stone, shipwreck. He persevered. In recent days, we've seen religious leaders treated with less than respect. And I want to say this. As true Christians become the target of persecution, leaders will undoubtedly become prime targets. We hold a biblical view Before the return of Christ, the persecution of the church will increase. And we have no biblical reason to believe that we'll get out before it gets too hot. So you better be prepared. The day may come when we will suffer persecution. Well, what are we going to do about it? What should we do about it? All of what we've been talking about, what are the various acts of zeal? Number one, it quickens us to our duty and makes us publicly active for God. Describing Paul in the book of Acts, his spirit was stirred within him. He was motivated. Secondly, it will cause us to spare no cost.
Are we prepared to spend? Are we prepared to be spent? Perhaps there's a lack of zeal. Thirdly, this zeal will manifest itself by holy grief and anger. When God's word and worship and servants are mistreated, attacked, holy grief and holy anger are righteous emotions when the cause of God suffers. Finally, our zeal should be characterized by two words, constant and consistent. I'm not talking about a flash in the pan, sudden three minute reaction talking about day after day after day after day. Well, we've covered our text from Psalm 119. May it awaken us, all of us, me included, day by day, week by week, year by year. be a, a wake-up call for us today. Let's pray. Lord, may it be said of us that our zeal for you, for your word, for your worship, for your servants, has concealed me, consumed me, May it be a zeal that is holy and righteous in its purpose. For your glory, for your cause, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.